I titled our sermon today, Faith That Finishes Well. You might want to call this long distance faith or persevering faith. You're going to see that in our scripture today. Uh, how about this? Let me start off with this, this thought, this question. If you're not healed or you have lots of trials in your life, does that mean that you don't have faith? Does that mean that God doesn't love you and God's not there for you? Well, I guess I can just wrap this up and we can go home because you already know. <laughs> but I think we need to address those questions and it is addressed in this message today. That, uh, and I think there's some bad teaching out there out there that you know once you become a Christian and everything goes well, and you've heard me say this many times, but for those who are new, those who may be joining us online, it's important that you hear this uh, afresh and new, and we as believers need to remember that as well. But the Bible addresses this in the later part of this chapter of Hebrews 11, and so it's important that we look at this. Now, does that mean that, uh, you know, that we should have weak faith? No. We should have faith. We should have strong faith. So we're going to see that as well. We should still believe for miracles, signs, and wonders because they still happen. And in fact, I want to invite you next week to hear a testimony right here on stage for both services of a miraculous healing in our church. And it's a powerful testimony of what God can do. And uh, you want to be here for that. It's going to be an amazing. And uh, if the Lord tarries and doesn't come back first, we'll see. Come, Lord. Save as many first, though, right? Hebrews 11, we're going to be in verse uh, 32. And let me give you a quick faith recap about what is faith in the book of Hebrews, especially in chapter 11. Faith in Hebrews 11 is belief. It's trust and confidence in God that enables the believer to press on steadfastly whatever the future holds. The Greek word for faith is pistis, and it's used 24 times in Hebrews 11 alone. It means the sense of confidence, certainty, trust, or trustworthiness of God, or God has guarantees for us, or assurance of God. Another form is pisteo, which means to trust to the point of obedience, to trust in such a way that you will obey. And that's trust and obey, right? For there is no other way. Anyone else had that song come to mind? So trust has to have legs that will obey God. God says it, we'll do it. You know, do we believe God and his word is trustworthy? Yes. If so, then there are plenty of situations where we can trust God to provide. We can trust God to intervene. We can trust God to work it out. If we believe that God and his word are trustworthy, then we know that his commands are trustworthy as well and that no matter what the results come from obeying him, we should obey him because we trust the results are, are good for us. So to do what God's word says is to do something that is gonna benefit us. And in the context of this scripture, the church of Hebrews, the church and the people that the author was writing to were going under and we're under severe persecution and opposition for leaving Judaism for Christianity. So they left the, the Judaism and they, and they came into Christ and because of that, they're facing persecution and it's pretty severe. And there is this danger that they could interpret their suffering as a sign of God's disapproval and to the point of giving up, or worse yet, go back to Judaism, because if I go back to Judaism, then I won't suffer all this persecution. There was this pressure to recant their Christian faith and come back to Judaism. And this is why the author goes through the examples of Hebrews 11 to increase their faith. And you're gonna see now, because we, we read all these great examples, how God delivers. What about the other side of faith? What about when faith doesn't deliver you from death or trials here on earth? On earth. Okay, what if, what if you still go through a lot of pain and suffering as a Christian? And that's really what the author does and he says to encourage the church, to inspire them to stay strong in the faith. He gives them both sides of faith. So let me get into it. 
think I've set it up enough. Hebrews chapter 11, verse 32, how much more, and I'm gonna start with this, this portion of scripture to give us more context again. How much more do I need to say? It would take too long to recount the stories of the faith of Gideon, Barak, Samson, Jephthah, David, Samuel, and all the prophets. By faith, these people overthrew kingdoms, ruled with justice, and received what God had promised them. They shut the mouths of lions. Who is that? Daniel. Quenched the flames of fire. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. And escaped death by the edge of the sword. Their weakness was turned to strength. They became strong in battle and put whole armies to flight. That was like Gideon, the weakest in the clan, but God used him to do great things. Women received their loved ones back again from death. Okay, so that was all the great deliverance. People of faith, they saw great deliverance. They saw God do amazing things. Kingdoms were overthrown. There was ruling with justice. There was miracles. And then the Hebrew writer ends with this, but others, others were tortured, refusing to turn from God in order to be set free. They placed their hope in a better life after the resurrection. Some of you might have the words better resurrection in your Bibles. So they placed their hope in a better resurrection. Some were jeered at and their backs were cut open with whips Others were chained in prisons. Some died by stoning. Some were sawed in half. And others were killed with the sword. Some went about wearing skins of sheep and goats, destitute and oppressed and mistreated. They were too good for this world, wandering over deserts and mountains, hiding in caves and holes in the ground. Wow. The other side of faith. And faith has another face. So whether there is deliverance, what we're seeing here is whether there is deliverance in this life or deliverance in the better resurrection realized in eternal glory, the outcome of faith in both instances is triumph. What we see here is, is that both groups of people had faith And both groups of people were commended for their faith, but some experienced miracles and deliverance here on earth, and some did not receive the same. They didn't get those results because God waited to give those results in the better resurrection, which we learned last week, that God resurrects all believers, all people. In the end, he will resurrect us into a better life than the one we're living now. So God had something better in store for them, and later on, we would all share in it. I love what Full Life Commentary writes. It says, true faith not only enables great exploits for God to be realized, so great miracles and amazing feats, but true faith also brings believers into great conflict with the world. Genuine faith does not immunize believers from suffering persecution, hardship, ridicule, or death. So genuine faith may lead to those things today. And it is in other countries more than us right now. I would say that we may not really suffer physical persecution that often here in America, like other countries, but we do suffer mistreatment or discrimination or oppression as Christians, right? Talked about that uh, faith under fire a few weeks ago. If we follow Jesus, if we do his commands, I want to warn you, you will face those things. And let me get a little strong here. If we ride this life on the couch, not doing God's work or will, if we compromise and go with the, the tide of culture and not go against it, if we do what the world wants us to do versus what God wants to do, then guess what? This will probably be a pretty easy life for you. But if you decide to follow Jesus and obey him, you will face ridicule. This church faces ridicule. I get the emails 
We get the YouTube messages. We get those things. People insult this church. If they don't insult you, just know they insult this church. People attack it. It's just the way it is, church. We need to get used to that if we're gonna follow Jesus in the end. Until the end. It's the way it's gonna be. Amen. This may not be the, the theology of faith that you've heard. Maybe you've heard the faith theology of, you know, everything goes great and everyone gets healed. Well, I love what this full life commentary note says as well. A theology of faith must include both a theology of suffering and a theology of the power of God, which is coupling together of the theology of the cross and the theology of the resurrection and Pentecost. You see, Jesus himself showed you true theology of faith, that if you're willing to obey, you could die for him. You will suffer for him. If you're willing to walk the narrow path, you will go through persecution. But the beauty of the gospel and the beauty of faith is, in the end, you will resurrect to a better resurrection. What does that mean, better resurrection? Let me explain that. When Lazarus was raised again from the dead, he woke up on this side of eternity again. He's like, what am I doing here again, huh? Where's heaven? Where's eternity? When we die now, we will be resurrected into a better life, an eternal life. That is greater than this life. Amen. I know no, no one wants to die. We don't want to. But the joy of the resurrection is that's the promise we have when we believe in Jesus Christ. There is a better life than the one we have right now. It's hard to realize that. It's hard to grasp that. Life is pretty good here. It's fun. And you know what? We should enjoy it as long as we stay in the boundaries of the word of God. We should enjoy this life. We should. We should, we should be so joyful that people go, wow, you're, you're a different kind of person. Who, 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 who are you? Why are you like this? And it's not because you have all these things it's because you have Jesus, and no matter what could happen in your life, you have joy that God is going to see you through every circumstance, every trial, and there's a better resurrection on the other end of this. That's why. <laughs> Praise the Lord. They were too good for this world. That's what he says about the people who were wearing sheep clothing and destitute and mistreated and hiding in caves and holes. They were just too good for this world. You know what he's trying to say there is, is they weren't going to find a great place to live. They weren't going to wear the finest clothes because this world wasn't even good enough for them. God loved them so much, he was preparing a better place for them. It's the same for us. Jesus has gone before us to prepare a place for us, praise the Lord. He's preparing it for all those who are faithful to the end, who will hold on to him to the end, and we're gonna experience that. I thank God for that. I'm looking forward to that. That's the hope I have. By the way, let us be careful not to look at God as a vending machine. You know, believing in him for all these things and forgetting the giver of all those gifts. Let us not look at God as a vending machine that I need to have faith for these things that come to me. What you want to do is have faith to have God. You want to have faith to look at God in all circumstances because you're not always going to get everything you pray for. You're not going to get everything you want when you want it. God is not going to be a vending machine if it's not good for you. What he wants is a relationship with you. That's how our series started is that it takes faith to have a relationship with God. It takes faith to please God. And it's impossible to please God without a faith relationship with him. That was the very first message we did on this series. God wants you to want him more than anything else. You know why? Because God is eternal life. And then everything else that we get in eternal life is gonna be amazing. It's icing on the cake. Mansions don't bring you peace. Gold streets don't bring you peace. God does. Those things don't give you true joy. God gives you those things. The reward 
that we have in heaven is gonna be God and then everything else he lavishes on us. Praise God for that. They were too good for this world. That's the upside down kingdom of God. The first will be last, the last will be first. You wanna be great in this world? Then serve. The upside down kingdom. Let's go to verse 39. He concludes with this. All these people earned a good reputation because of their faith. Oh, wait, so they were, they were just as commendable as the ones who got delivered from everything. The ones that died and were beheaded and sawed in half, they were commended just as much as Daniel and the lion's den and Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Their faith was just as great, but they didn't, they didn't survive. They weren't delivered. All these people earned a good reputation because of their faith, yet none of them received all that God had promised. For God had something better in mind for us so that they would not reach perfection without us. So what do we do while we wait? What do we do while we wait for the perfection that God has planned for all of us at the resurrection, at the coming of Christ? And we learned this last week at Easter Sunday. If you're back today, praise the Lord, you're learning even more about this. But one day, whether we die or whether Jesus comes back first, we are all resurrected. We're given new bodies. And that is the better resurrection. In the meantime, what do we do? I love what the commentary says in Full Life Commentary. It says, the, in the interim between promise, promise of that resurrection and fulfillment of it, faith must be tough. Tough in the hard times. Resilient in trying circumstances. Obedient to God and his word at all times. And able, like love, to endure all things. While moving toward the goal embodied in what God has promised, faith does not shrink back or give up when discouraged. It is always daring, adventurous, and willing to risk all for the sake of the things promised but not yet seen. That's faith, according to Hebrews chapter 11. That is the faith that we must have. Again, if we get off these sidelines and we get busy for the work of the Lord and we, we believe in what he says and we do what his word says and when those times come when you're question of your faith, do we shrink back and say something that would be, you know, you know not un unoffensive or, of course, should we always say things with truth and love? Yes, with love and speak it in truth. Whatever the situation may be at work, you're told to be quiet, about your faith, you're on lunch break, someone talks to you about it, the word spreads that you're talking about Jesus at work. Well, it was actually a lunch break and I'm allowed to do that. Whatever it may be, right? It may be online that you're, you're sharing scripture and people come at you. It may be in your neighborhood, you're trying to show love to someone no one else is showing love and they come at you for it. It could be many things. When you do the will of God, you will experience these things. And I wanna encourage you to have faith that stays strong. When everyone around you is doing whatever they want, young people, especially in high school, middle school, college, when everyone, I was talking to some students last week that go to U of D, encouraging them to make sure they're plugged into some kind of Bible campus club and group. Can you imagine going to the University of Delaware and everyone's doing whatever they want in, the, in, in this world, partying every night, having sex and doing all these things, drugs and all that, and meanwhile, you're two Christians on this huge campus trying to be faithful to God. You know how hard that is? That's the real life for college students. That's real life for middle schoolers. That's real life for high schoolers. It's hard. Will they remain faithful? Will they be resilient? Will they stay on the narrow path? Will they be made fun of for not touching the drugs, made fun of for not enjoying alcohol? Will they be made fun of for being virgins until the day they're married? If they stay faithful, yes, you will be made fun of. I was. But I don't regret any of that. I don't regret any of that. I don't regret any of that. Stay strong. Stay strong. What matters most is whether we please God, not, not man. Well, that's not the end of our scripture. We read the last two verses, but 
actually the Bible keeps going. Later on, we broke down the Bible in chapters and this may have been a bad place to break it up. We need to go to chapter 12. Verse one, the great conjunctive adverb, therefore. What is all this there for? What is all this information there? For what reason is it there? Well, he leaves them with this important and and much more after these few verses, but we're gonna focus on just three. He says, therefore, since we are surrounded by such a crowd of witnesses to the life of faith, let me just go ahead and teach through this, okay? Let me just stop and teach through this. Therefore, since we're surrounded, okay, and he's gonna go into this analogy of a race, and this is why we believe it's the Apostle Paul, because he loved to compare the Christian life or use the Christian life illustration with a race or marathon. Uh, And he, how many of you know, I mean, not me, I'm not a marathon runner, as you can see. (laughs) When I got to Polytech, they hounded me to play football, and for good reason. I just have a different frame than a long-distance cross-country runner, okay? I tried cross-country in middle school. I about died the first day. I also have asthma, allergy-induced asthma, so whenever... Um, pollen is bad in Delaware, which is pretty much all year round. I, well, especially this past week. But we're going to get into this analogy of this race and this marathon. But he says that there's a huge crowd of people who have run this race already, which we just read about in Hebrews 11. And the word witness doesn't mean that they're watching you, even though that would be cool. The word witness is is that we get to look at their lives and see their testimonies, like Daniel, Shadrach, Meshach, Abednego, all the people. We get to look at their lives as an example for us. Now, one writer did say that it could be that they're watching us in the stadium of life, cheering us on from the sidelines in the stadium. How cool would that be? It's okay, though, if they don't, because we know Jesus does, and still he did, and he still does. Jesus is that one who's constantly interceding on our behalf, constantly cheering us on. We don't know whether people really watch you. Let me just get into this real quick. We don't really know if people really watch us from heaven, okay? Just not to pop any bubbles there. The only time we know that is all of heaven rejoices when one person gives their life to Jesus. So that is, yes, that is one way we know. The angels and the people of God are rejoicing, so maybe they do. Some writers say they don't. Some writers, some theologians say that maybe people do see us run this race. It's okay, that's not the point of witness here. What the point is, is we have biblical testimonies, biblical witnesses who have run the race of the Christian life before us, and it's a huge crowd of them. So if you're not encouraged by Daniel, you could probably go to Deborah. And if Deborah's not helpful, you can probably go to Jeremiah. And you just go through the list of all these people who who had faith in God and went through so many terrible things and yet they stayed faithful to him. That's what he's saying here. Therefore, since we have such a huge crowd of witnesses, what does he say next? Let us strip off every weight that slows us down. Now, this is actually broken in two parts because the next part says, especially the sin that so easily trips us up. Let us shake off the weight that hinders us or weighs us down. Now, I'm, like I said, I'm not a cross-country runner. I'm not a marathon runner. I was more of a sprinter. And sprinting off the line, playing soccer, although soccer, you need endurance, I still didn't have it. Uh, always dying on the sidelines anytime I had a chance just to get a break. And you would never catch me in those short shorts that marathon runners wear. My goodness. Those things are just scary. (laughs) Not a fan of the really tiny, you know, track tank tops. But that... (laughs) Let me just drink some water real quick. Some people have that physique. They can handle that. That's fine. Not me. You won't catch me dead in those things. But what's the point? A runner doesn't wear a hoodie. A runner doesn't wear jeans and boots. A runner is dressed to win the race. 
to get rid of anything that may slow them or hinder them down. And so those aren't bad things. Those can be good things. Like having a hoodie is good. Having jeans and boots, those are needed things for certain times. But when it's time to live the Christian life, we need to shed things off of our lives that could be good, but it's too much. So I like a good movie. I like my couch, sort of. I need to get a new one, I think. (laughs) I don't like my bed. I definitely need a new bed. But comfort can be a problem for a runner. If you're going to run a marathon, it's going to get uncomfortable. If you're going to run for Jesus, it's going to get uncomfortable. If we start to idolize and love comfort, we probably won't run the race we should be. See, there's, sometimes there's a, there's a good of too much, uh, too much good of something or something. Anyway, you get the point, okay? Too much of a good thing. That's what it was. Thank you, Lord. Too much of a good thing, right? Hey, you can get rest, but the Bible teaches that slothfulness is a sin. Being lazy is a sin. Not doing your part in the family of God is actually rebuked in the letters of the New Testament. Not using your gift is wrong. Not getting in the race and doing what God has saved you for is not why God saved you, to sit on the pews and to sit in the sidelines of game of life and not be in the race. That is sinful. It is. And at least start with prayer, right? And let the prayer life move you to action because you can't pray for people unless you start helping people. It's just not gonna work. You're going to find your heart growing for people so much that you got to get in there and help someone. Because you shouldn't pray, Lord, I pray that someone else helps them. <laughs> I think it's her. <laughs> no, no one does that. Eventually, you pray to God and you're praying for people, your heart is going to be moved to do something. All right? So we got to get rid of some weight that is holding us back from running the race And by the way, in America, there are a lot of temptations and distractions, isn't there? There's a lot of things that could distract us from running this race. Let me give you a simple one. The Bible calls us to know the Lord, to know God, to grow in the knowledge and the grace of God. So we need to read our word. So too much of something else that's interfering with us reading the word is a problem. We're not running the race. And he says to run the race in such a way to win the prize, not to barely make it. The Christian life is a life of thriving and winning, not losing all the time, especially in this battle between God and this world. We don't have to keep losing that battle. And that brings me to the next point. Throw off the sin that so easily trips us up or entangles us. You know why the devil wants you to keep sinning? Because it gives him a door, a foothold in in your life an opportunity to make you feel ashamed and guilty and disgusting and unworthy of running the race for God. In fact, if we are careful to resist temptation and if we're careful to remain uh, free of sin and, and be holy, now none of us are perfect, we all mess up, right? But if we're just giving in left and right, that's a problem. We're, con- we're not on the race properly. Okay, but if, if, if we do, if we keep giving in to sin, we keep giving the devil ammo to hurt us. We keep giving him reasons to attack us. And by the way, when you live faithful and you don't give in to sin and you throw off the weight, you're still gonna be attacked by the devil because now you're even more of a threat. In fact, he sends, you ready for this? He'll send believers to attack you. He'll send people you wouldn't expect to attack you, to shame you, to make you feel bad, all those things. But we do need to resist temptation. Now, if you're, if you're a runner, unlike me, you know, one of the things that you resist, okay, what you're told that you cannot have is PEDs, performance enhancing drugs, right? You shouldn't eat chicken wings every day. That's not gonna work if you're gonna run the marathon. There's things you must resist. There's temptations that you must not give into. 
He's saying, do not give in to those things because they could disqualify you to receive the crown, to receive the prize. They can hurt your journey. They don't make you effective in the faith. And we don't have to. We don't have to carry the weight. Let me get into that for a moment. Jesus has come to give you freedom from your past. Don't pick it back up, whether that's sinful or whether it's something you've done wrong. He wants you to be free. He gives you rest. You know, you know what's really heavy to carry? What's really heavy to carry is unconfessed sin. David said it was crushing his bones and his body to go through life not confessing his sin. If you wanna run the race for God, shed that sin out of your life. Tell another believer you can trust to confess to and pray with you. Someone who's not gonna gossip about that sin either. But go to someone you can trust and say, this is weighing me down. Or if you've sinned against someone, go to that person and say, I'm sorry, I did this. You have no idea, but I did this behind your back and I'm sorry. And watch and feel the weight lift off your shoulders. Whether they forgive you or not, you've done what the word of God says. Humble yourself before the Lord. Let go of that weight. Take ownership for what you did wrong. And on the other side, when someone does take ownership and they've truly repented, they're truly sorry, they show a spirit of sorrow, they, they don't blame anyone else, they don't go, yeah, but they did this to me. No, that's not true sorrow and repentance. When you're truly sorry, David didn't blame Bathsheba. Do we know that story? She was bathing outside. He's watching. That temptation lured him. He brought her in. He slept with her. He kills her husband. He never once blamed her for doing what she did. He always took ownership for everything he did. There's a difference, isn't there? Throw off any blame, any deflection. Throw it all off. Truly repent, okay? When someone does that, you can truly forgive, can't you too? We need to forgive people because that weight also slows you down in the race of life, in the journey of life. Got a little heavy in here, didn't it? Because that was a serious story. Wow. So we run this race, getting rid of the weight, getting, staying away from the sins so that we can win the prize. And guess what? He says something huge to do that. We do this, number, verse two, we do this by keeping our eyes on Jesus. Fix your eyes on Jesus. It says here, the champion, he already won. This is after the cross, after the resurrection, he already won the race for us. The champion who initiates and perfects our faith because of the joy awaiting him What's that joy? The joy of obeying his father and saving mankind. That's why he was willing to do it. The joy of seeing the results of his crucifixion and death. He had joy to do it. It says he endured the cross because of it, disregarding its shame. Now he is seated in the place of honor beside God's throne. Think of all the hostility he endured from sinful people. Then you won't become weary and give up. Jesus, amen. Jesus is the forerunner of faith. Jesus goes before us. He did. He continues to run the race before us. He continues to intercede for us. He has accomplished this race. The Bible says, fix your eyes on Jesus when it gets hard. He endured things you will never have to endure. And he did it so he could sympathize with you. He was tempted he was tempted 40 days in the desert, hungry, he was tempted. Any of you done that yet? Wow. He could have called upon angels to save him and spare him, but his faith said, I'll obey God until death. So he died. 
He could have called that on. He didn't have to carry that weight. He didn't have to bleed out blood in the, in the garden of Gethsemane. He could have called on angels to save him, but he took, he, he took that on for all of us that so we wouldn't have to carry that weight. The weight of our past, the weight of sin, the weight of, of the world, we could be free and run the race. And then if it's not over yet, thank, thank the Lord, not only did he do all that, he goes to heaven and now he's seated beside the Lord God and he's interceding on our behalf. He's praying for us right now. He hasn't stopped caring for us. <laughs> Praise God. See, what this scripture is showing us is we're gonna get weary and tired of running this race. Our faith is gonna get, is gonna get challenged. Fix your eyes on Jesus then. Don't fix your eyes somewhere else. He is the greatest example of faith. Of course, we have all the other examples, praise the Lord, but Jesus is the prime example. And that's why the writer gets into Hebrews 12, one through three to help us. Let me land this plane today. Number one, all right, buckle up, here we go. Faith in God doesn't always produce the same results on this side of eternity. That's what we're learning in this scripture today. Two different groups of people, both had faith that God commends, but different results on this side of eternity, right? Faith doesn't always do that. That's why we need to be careful not to judge someone as having little faith when they're not healed or dealt with more trials in their lives. I've heard it before. I've heard people say, Ryan, I wasn't healed. Someone said I didn't have enough faith then, and it was all on me. Well, I mean, Jesus does confront the people in the New Testament and says, ye of little faith, so we need to have faith, but faith the size of a mustard seed, right? But in the end, it's God's decision what to do and how to do it and when to do it. It's his will. You should not be condemned like that. People go through trials. Oh, they must not have enough faith because they're constantly, they must be sinners because they're constantly going through trials. No, we don't do that. We don't condemn and judge people like that. No, because what we see here is people of faith got killed for their faith. Am I right or am I wrong? Secondly, faith in God is being faithful to God in every circumstance, no matter the results. See, faith in God is about being faithful to him in every circumstance, no matter what results you get. What we see here in this scripture today, correct me if I'm wrong, but it shows Two groups of people having faith in God that God commends and they both get different results. One dies, the other one gets delivered. Why? Because there's a better resurrection for everyone. There's a better life to come. Some have the grace of God that he's gonna give them a deliverance and a healing or a, through a breakthrough, through a trial here on earth. And some, they're gonna wait till heaven. But both of us are people of faith. Both of us have faith. It's important we understand that. It's also important to understand that it takes faith for the miracle and faith to trust God until the end. It takes faith for the miracle and faith for God's will to be done. They both take faith, don't they? If God decides not to give me a breakthrough or deliverance now, it takes faith to wait for it, doesn't it? It takes faith to wait for eternity, doesn't it? It takes faith. Are you with me? I know, this is, this is some stuff to think about and chew on. This is when we don't get the results we want. This is when we must not be discouraged by short-term pain, but fix our eyes on long-term gain. I was joking earlier that, you know, I, I've prayed for many, many times for healed eyes, no allergies. I don't know if that's possible in Delaware, but now it is. All things are possible with God. But I gotta just make sure we get on the same page here real quick. I'm grateful for the eyesight I have. I'm grateful for glasses. You know what? I'm not really grateful for allergies, but I'm just glad that I'm here. And if I gotta take some meds here and there, or I gotta hide out in the house and hide from those pollen that's trying to kill me, I'll do that. I'm just grateful for life. 
Do I believe God can heal me? Absolutely. He can. There's got to be a good purpose behind it too, right? There's got to be a reason. Well, here's the other thing too. Do you remember the story where the lame man was being carried by his four friends on a stretcher? And they had the faith to bring him before Jesus and they break down the roof and they lower him through. Why didn't Jesus heal him right away from being lame? Why did he forgive him of his sins first? Because what good is it to have healed legs but still go to hell? I am grateful for my salvation that's gonna give me even more healings in the end in the next life things I haven't even prayed for yet, I'm going to be healed of. That's the right perspective to have. This doesn't mean to discourage you from believing God for miracles. This, I'm not trying to discourage you to have little faith or I'm not trying to do any of that. In fact, next week, you're going to hear a story that really fits with this sermon. I still hold on to faith. I still hold on to miracles. And I've seen, I've seen God do it here in this church. That's why you're going to hear this testimony next week. Make sure you invite people to come out. It's going to be a powerful time. We're going to pray for people for healings. Lastly, or I'm sorry, thirdly, faith in God is being faithful to God on the narrow path leading to eternity. It's a narrow path we're living. We got to be obedient. Noah chose righteousness and obedience, so he built an ark. And sure enough, we're, I'm grateful he did that because we're, we're here because of it. Joseph chose fidelity instead of infidelity and received prison. But later on, God redeems all that and gives him second in command in the nation. Daniel chose prayer to God and received the lion's den, but he was spared. Job chose faithfulness instead of cursing God. He lost everything, but he still chose to worship God instead of curse God. The disciples chose to follow Christ and they received persecution and death. That was the end for them. They didn't stay alive forever. They are now, but they died. Paul chose Jesus and was beheaded. The writer of this book, we believe, of Hebrews, was beheaded for his faith. Was he a man of uh, a lack of faith? Was he a man of no faith? Absolutely, he had great faith, but he died. He was persecuted. He chose to obey God instead of give in to the pressure to recant his faith, and he died. That was faith. I think we get the point, right? Faith in God, lastly, faith in God may produce different results now, but full redemption will be realized in eternity. Full redemption of everything will be realized in eternity. Everything you prayed for, Everything that you needed in your body, everything that we need to see, deliverance, will be done. Praise the Lord. And Jesus, I'm, I'm cashing in in heaven. That rede- I'm redeeming all that. I'm just going to wait for it. I'm waiting for it. Doesn't mean I don't stop praying for it now and believing now. Let God do what he wants to do. When Paul was on his deathbed, pretty much, he, was, he knew he was going to die. He wrote these these words to his understudy pastor, Timothy, 2 Timothy 4, 6 through 8, and I, I think we should really hang on to this for our own life. For I am already being poured out like a drink offering, and the time for my departure is near. I have fought the good fight. I have finished the race. I have kept the faith. Now there is in store for me the crown of righteousness which the Lord, the righteous judge, will award to me on that day. And not only to me, but also to all who have longed for his appearing. Praise the Lord. Fight the good fight, my friends. Finish the race. Keep the faith. In case you felt like God is not watching you, not caring for your needs, let me share with you this last scripture. Romans 8, 35 through 37. Can anything ever separate us from Christ's love? Nope. Does it mean he no longer loves us if we have trouble or calamity or are persecuted or hungry or destitute or in danger or threatened with death? 
As the scriptures say, for your sake, we are killed every day. We are being slaughtered like sheep. No, despite all these things, overwhelming victory is ours through Christ who loved us. That is what we receive. Praise the Lord. So there you have it. Faith looks different for different people in different situations. God sees us. Jesus knows. Jesus knew when he said that about the people, ye of little faith. He knows better than we do. Let us not judge based on people's journeys. We have to remember that God is in charge. What's most important about faith, according to Hebrews 11, is being faithful to him no matter what happens and having faith to hold on to what's to come. The things I do not see yet have not been fulfilled. They will be fulfilled. I look forward to it. In the meantime, God, I know you're a miracle worker. In the meantime, God, I know that I must be obedient to you no matter what comes, and I will be. I will hold on to faith. I will fight the good fight. Amen? Why don't we stand together as we pray? <laughs> so, yeah, he's done. <laughs> She's got endurance. She's got faith that endures right there, hanging on this long. Let's pray. God, in this room right now, if people have been discouraged by their circumstances, I pray, God, that they would have renewed faith today. You see what we're going through. God, you never fail us. You love us. God, you love us in such a way that you will deliver the way you want, when you want, how you want, the timing of it all. And God, we can't forget the better resurrection that's to come. One day, we're not gonna go through anything that we struggle with here. And we're grateful for that. God, in the meantime, this race that we are in, this, this long distance race that's not a sprint, it's a journey for life. God, give us the faith to believe for miracles. Give us the faith to believe for your will to be done. Strengthen our faith today. Thank you for the heroes before us. Thank you, God, that we stand on the shoulders of those who went before us. Most of all, we thank you for Jesus, the champion of faith, the one who's the author, perfecter, and finisher of our faith. We trust in Jesus. God, when things get hard, we look at Jesus. And he was resurrected. Our situations can change here on earth, but we know for sure everything will be changed in eternity. Because of this, God, because of this word today, Lord, we can stand strong no matter what the devil throws at us, trying to make us question your faithfulness. We're not going to question it. You are faithful. We won't look at our results or circumstances. We're going to look at you and fix our eyes on you. Your plans will be done. We thank you for that. Lord, if anyone today has not believed in Jesus Christ, for their salvation from sin, salvation from their past, even their present circumstances, who need you, God, who need to call upon you for salvation and eternal life, who do not have that promise yet of the better resurrection, and they need to believe in you for, the, for it, Lord. I pray today you would move upon their hearts, Lord, to believe in Jesus Christ, to call upon Jesus as their Lord and Savior, knowing that you have forgiven us of our sins, and you give us eternal life when we believe in you. And it's not just a sprint. It's not just a one-time decision. It's a life decision to follow you all the days of our lives. God, thank you for the faith, for salvation, and the faith to endure. We love you, God. We thank you. We ask all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. 